This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know, and we are here punctuating a bit of a extended summer vacation, but there's a timeliness to this episode, a fascinating new book out by our guest, Jason Greenblatt. The book is called In the Path of Abraham, and it is a fitting title given that Jason, a long-standing attorney, became a surprising White House operative and helped architect the historic Abraham Accords several years ago. Of course, it's a transformative pact that has really reshaped the Middle East and brought a great deal of hope and promise where it was sorely lacking in that region. Now, I have to be totally honest, I was a little bit concerned about the political nature of this particular episode. Certainly, the former president is perhaps the greatest lightning rod in today's society. And I myself, in full transparency, am not a particular fan, at least of the conduct and certainly surrounding the January 6th situation. And in general, I really do try to steer clear of politics on this show. Our goal here is to feature uplifting, meaningful personalities, perhaps a respite from the polarization of the world. If you're a regular listener, you'll know that we have highlighted people from all across the spectrum, both religiously and politically. And so I don't want to become mired or pigeonholed by one particular persuasion. That being said, the events surrounding the Abraham Accords and the individuals connected to them I believe we're so extraordinary that they transcend the character flaws or political proclivities of any one figure. In particular, Jason Greenblatt is a soft-spoken, humble, and deeply committed Jew, a man of great integrity who truly made historic change in our world. And I'm hopeful that even those listeners who are viscerally opposed to Trump as a figure, as a president, and so forth, can set that aside and appreciate the greatness of this achievement and of the individuals behind it, with Jason Greenblatt right there in the center of that august group. And so with that extended disclaimer, a reminder as always to follow us on social media, at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook. Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Please subscribe or follow wherever you're listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, any podcast platform. Please spread the word so that others do so as well. And now to our conversation with attorney and chief architect of the Abraham Accords, Jason Greenblatt. We are here with Jason Greenblatt, who was uh, recently a Middle East envoy and one of the primary architects of the incredible Abraham Accords, which really revolutionized the state of Arab-Israeli relations and really global uh, politics more broadly. And we're going to get into all of that. But first of all, how are you, Jason? I'm great. So great to be here with you today. Thanks for having me as a guest. I'm so happy to have you. And a shout out to uh, my friend and uh, study partner, Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt, who uh, is always looking out for great guests for me. And to be honest, Jason, the, uh, your name has actually been in my mind for a while, but I wasn't sure how do I meet him. And Stuart uh, pulled through for me. So thank you. And um, let's take it from the top. Tell us a little bit about where you are coming from. What was your early background? Sure. So, you know, typical. New York, New Jersey guy. I grew up in New York in an observant family, went to uh, Yeshiva University High School, Yeshiva University for college and where you law school. And uh, later, after I became a lawyer, found myself working for the Trump organization. Um, I had a total of 20 years there. Uh, I started as a junior lawyer, made my way up to chief legal officer. And then Donald Trump decided to run for president, ran, won, and I guess you could say the rest is history. There you go. So we'll, we'll certainly unpack all of that. Um, but going back to your early origins, it was your family American or did you come from uh, your know, survivors? How did your family end up in this part of the world? Both my parents were from Hungary. Um, my father grew up in a small village called Satmar Cheka, managed to escape Hungary with his family, really just as the Nazis started to come to Hungary. Is uh, The story that I understand from growing up is that his mom was trying desperately to get all the visas lined up to let them escape. 
Each time she managed to get one, another one had expired. And one day she managed to line them all up. And they, I've heard two versions of this, a German diplomat. Another one said it was a German soldier, I think, on Shabbos basically said, get on this train or you may never make it out. And uh, apparently pushed them onto this train. They managed to make it out and they all started a new life here in the United States. So quite remarkable. My mother had a different experience. They lived in uh, Debrecen, which is not a big city, but certainly far bigger than my father's town. And uh, they managed to, I guess they were lucky. They were on a train. I'm told that the train tracks, they were being sent to Auschwitz was their understanding. Some train tracks along the way were bombed. Train was rerouted. And they ended up in a camp in Vienna and survived. My grandmother's siblings ended up all over the world, Brazil, Uruguay, Australia, Israel, and the United States. My mom's siblings uh, mostly or all really ended up in uh, the United States. And in both cases, you know, both families were able to build uh, upon, you know, new lives really here. And each of them had so many kids and we were a very close family growing up and, you know, uh, a lot of Hungarian imprint, if you like. And great caucus cake. It's interesting you talk about the tracks being bombed because, you know, the great critique of so many of, you know, the administrations, FDR, didn't bomb the tracks. Why didn't they bomb the tracks? They knew what was going on. And here actually it sounds like at least in one case that did prevent some uh, deportations. It's true. And I, I don't know the origin of the bombing. I don't know if it was the United States, another ally, uh, perhaps uh, some uh, saboteur. I'm not sure. But thank God it happened. And thank God both families were okay and saved. Was the Holocaust a looming force in your life growing up? Only as a, a Jew, right? An American Jew or a Jew generally around the world, meaning we were educated about it. We understood it. But my father came at a quite a young age, I think around 12. My mom was a fairly young teenager, maybe 16 or 17, if I recall correctly. So we didn't have the same trauma as those fans who were real survivors of the camps. You know, it was more very important to learn about to help build who we are who we became like most of my classmates uh, probably like all of my classmates but not this direct uh, this happened to your dad or your mom or your grandmother what was the state of the community when you were growing up did you grow up in in the suburbs if you were in brooklyn or manhattan i grew up in queens um you know it's remarkable what that generation was able to create uh I think back and I wonder if my generation and my kids' generation would have the stamina and the strength after having survived in various forms this crazy, murderous attack to try to destroy European Jewry. They came here, all of them, and they just built these amazing communities, yeshivot and synagogues and everything that you needed to be a Jew to live in this blessed country. I mean, you know, I can't say it any more clearly. We are so blessed to live in the United States. But none of what we have today, I think, would exist if it wasn't for the stamina and the strength and the drive of this generation that came before my generation or the generations, because I think it's really two generations. Was it difficult for your parents to preserve their observance? Obviously, so many people you know, banned observance, whether because of the trauma uh, you know, that they endured or just because of acculturation to American life. Um, but it sounds like your family really stayed fairly uh, strong. The, was that kind of consistent throughout? Was that was there was there ever you know wavering or were they really very uh, steadfast? No, the, it wasn't wavering. I mean, they settled in a community where there was good infrastructure, you know, multiple schools, uh, multiple day schools. It was very important to them, even though it was they they were not financially well off, but very important to them to send us to uh, yeshiva day school where we learned what we needed to learn to be productive, uh, observant Jews. Uh, they sent us to day camp and then eventually sleepaway camp. So I didn't, um, no wavering at all, but I think that they chose well in terms of where to raise a family with respect to uh, observant Judaism. So now going into your young uh, adult years, you migrated. I feel like you should get like a, you know, a cap or a, a t-shirt from Yeshiva University, did the uh, high school MTA and then uh, went there undergrad. You didn't go to Cardozo though. So you kind of broke the streak. <laughs> That's, true. <laughs> That's true. But what were your early aspirations? Did you have a clear sense that you wanted to be this, uh, be an attorney, fairly uh, typical route for a, uh, a young Jewish man? What were your early designs? 
You know, it's a little bit funny if my parents, unfortunately, neither of them is alive. My mom passed away 19 years ago. My father passed away uh, less than a year ago. I'm still in the Azalea's year. If I sat down with them, both of them now, if I had the opportunity, sorry, if I had the opportunity to sit down with both of them now and uh, review the trajectory of my career, it's so far off from what they had envisioned. You know, they drilled into my head like some or many Jewish parents, you have to be a doctor, you know, and uh, I studied a little bit of science when I started YU. Uh, it just wasn't for me. And eventually, while I was at YU, I decided I would become a lawyer, went to NYU Law School, it was great, ended up at a big law firm. And I enjoyed my career as a lawyer, both as a young attorney at a big law firm, and then eventually um, at the Trump organization. But then, you know, life turned again. And then I found myself working in the White House, something I never would have imagined. And I'm sure my parents never would have imagined. Or my grandparents, when they brought their kids here after escaping the Holocaust. Um, again, I go back to this amazing country that we live in. People came here with almost no money, uh, escaping persecution or murder, right? And then their grandchild ends up working at the White House. Um, really quite amazing. An American dream tale, if, uh, if, if there's ever been one. Um, so you were this young attorney, and I guess working in a you know big law, as they call it, and doing the corporate route. Um, did you see yourself ideally staying in that on that track and going for the you know the partnership track and and all of that? That uh, was that kind of your your intention. I wouldn't say it was an intention, and and it's always hard to be on that partnership track. You never know where it leads. Um, I would say I was I had a great experience at the first law firm, Fried Frank. Uh, they were amazing to work at and with, and super respectful of me being an observant Jew. And then spent a short amount of time at another firm that was also really good. Uh, but when the knock came on my door for an in-house position, I ran. There's a little story associated with that, if you want me to diverge. I would love to hear it. Absolutely. So I, I guess it's slightly misleading to say I ran because uh, this was a life lesson that I teach my kids. And anytime I mentor people, I got a call from a headhunter who said that he had an in-house position. Um, I was working really hard, as most young lawyers do, and certainly at the time and probably still do. And the headhunter wouldn't tell me who the interview was with where the position was, unless I was wanting to come to his office, which was, you know, a good half an hour subway ride. I did the mental math. I just decided I was too busy that day. And if he wouldn't share the name with me, I just couldn't go. Uh, he called me back a couple of times by the third call. I was so intrigued. I decided to take the time to go see him. And uh, he mentioned that it was for Donald Trump. And of course, Donald Trump was very famous then, but, you know, uh, scratching the surface to how he's famous. What year was this, by the way? Uh, this was probably 96. So we're talking still pre-apprentice day, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, he was important and famous as a real estate developer, but not, you know, what he accomplished um, once I got there, not because of me, obviously, but because of him and his kids, is night and day to uh, what he accomplished even before that, although he did some pretty big projects before that as well. So when he told me the name, my mouth dropped open. It was very hard to get in-house jobs at that time. This one was particularly exciting given uh, Donald Trump's profile and the projects he had worked on. So uh, that's where I ran. You know, uh, and I didn't look back. It led to, and thank God, it led to some pretty incredible things. Now, did you have a, I assume you must have had a background in real estate law in, in the practice that you were in Freed Frank? Yeah, I was a young real estate lawyer at the time. And although that's the focus of why Trump wanted to hire me, you know, he over the years became involved in so many different things. You mentioned The Apprentice earlier. So he was involved in entertainment, hospitality, you know, huge golf company, big hotel company, residential uh, development, commercial development. And, you know, the real estate was a core of what I did. But one of the things that made the job incredibly interesting was the variety of what he, uh, Donald Trump and his family uh, got into in terms of their business. Now, I can't probably think of a topic that elicits more strong opinion than the gentleman you worked for. So I'm going to try to keep this as subjective as possible because I want to know about your experience and not, you know, not from the political angle or, or the opinions that people have from, you know, all different sides of the equation. But what was your experience working there and what was, you know, your, your early work like? I imagine early on you had less exposure directly to Trump. And then later on, that probably, it sounds like that increased you know, significantly. But what was, what was your 
path there and, and what was your experience in the company? So it's true. I had less exposure at the beginning and then, of course, grew into the role and more and more exposure. And, you know, um, I don't want to say near constant, but my, my office eventually was only two doors down from him. So whether I was with him all day or not, I was there. My experience with him and his family was fantastic. He was a really excellent boss. That doesn't mean he wasn't demanding, but he was running a major company and had to get deals done. Lots of employees to, uh, to pay. I think anybody who works at that level, of course, needs to make sure that the wheels are running smoothly, but always respectful to me, to my family, to me being an observant Jew. Uh, the same is true of his kids. So I had um, just a hugely positive experience, not only during those 20 years, but also during the almost three years I spent at the White House. Are there any uh, I guess experiences that stand out, any stories that stand out from that? period that I mean, 20 years is a long time, but any, you know, really unique places that you traveled or encounters that you had? Well, let me start with uh, his, his respect for me being an observant Jew. It's a story I like to tell because despite how you hear about Donald Trump and the media, and, and I'm not going to defend every tweet he issued, I'm not going to defend every statement he says. There are things that, you know, he says differently than I would say, differently than I want my kids to talk. Um, but then again, I'm sure there are times that my wife might say, hey, honey, you know, maybe you need to say that differently, right? Everybody has uh, their thing. Um, there was one particular transaction when I did start to have significant experience with him and, you know, work directly with him, which happened around the time of September, where the holidays, the Jewish holidays, the Chagim, were those three-day holidays. So you're basically turning off three days in a row uh, multiple times during the course of the month. And I was working on a major deal. Uh, I was the guy in charge of that deal from a legal perspective. And I, I did everything I could to get the deal closed before the holidays. I slept in the office for a couple of nights. It became, the, it became a joke at some point. But, you know, my view very much was if Donald Trump and his family are going to be respectful of me being an observant Jew, then I have to be respectful of them and their business and do everything within my power to not let the holiday interfere if I could. But, you know, it was unlucky that it just didn't happen. And by the way, it's not because people didn't try. I mean, forget the people, my colleagues at the Trump Organization, who also tried to let, make the deal close. Even uh, the people on the opposite side of the deal at other big firms were very cooperative in trying to make things happen. But big deals are big deals, and sometimes you just can't get it done. And I remember being incredibly, I don't know if I'd use the word disappointed, but both uncomfortable and sad that I couldn't get it down and I had to march myself down to his office and it wasn't a very long walk uh, with a lump in my throat to basically, I, I think I felt like I was letting him down and letting the company down. And I told him what was going on. And he said, Jason, go home, go pray, be with your family and we'll pick it up after the holiday. A pretty remarkable statement from somebody, you know, there's a lot going on the line. A deal could not happen. A lot of effort was put into the deal a lot of money, you know, was expected to be made from the deal. And it could have been me that collapsed the deal, but he was just so gracious about how he handled it. After the holiday came back, put the, everything back into high gear. We closed the deal, thank God. But I think that really shows the essence of the Donald Trump that I know and that I worked for, uh, no matter what we see on some of the major, um, some of the news media, right? And and again, I'm not going to sit here and say that everything that he says is perfect and this and that, but little attention is paid sometimes to who he is as a person. It gets um, drowned out by uh, politics, by people who just want to attack, uh, gets drowned out by all sorts of other issues. My experience was only positive. I think we got into one disagreement in the 23 years I worked for him. I'd love to hear about that disagreement. <laughs> Well, he, he wrote about it in his book, so I guess I could talk. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it had to do with that salary one. You know, one year that I was due for a raise, my then boss didn't feel comfortable going to bad for me for whatever reason. I, you know, it made sense, so I had to do it myself. There are two versions of the story. There's Donald Trump's version and my version, and we remember the story a little bit differently. I was a young person at the time. It took me a little bit of time to summon up the courage to go in and deal with him directly. I checked, you know, the pulse of what was going on, as I recall, um, very, very well. And eventually, at the end of the day, I was told it was a good time. I went in and, you know, it wasn't a good time. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. And, uh, you know, several weeks later, after that little disagreement, 
he ended up giving me that raise and more, which, you know, I'm very grateful for. But let's just say it was a very, very unpleasant experience for me. His story is that, or his recollection is that I was with him a lot that day, should have known that it wasn't a good day, came in at the wrong time. Um, he, he wrote it very nicely, you know, very respectfully, but he definitely made it known that I chose the wrong day to ask for that raise. And let's just say I'm comfortable with my version. I'm sure he's comfortable with his version. It happened a long time ago and it was rectified pretty quickly. Yeah, the bottom line is you got the raise. So it, you ended up on the right end of things. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. So it's, I guess, 2014, 15, when the possibility of him running for president began to emerge as a, a serious possibility. And at first it was treated as kind of a, an afterthought or a, a sideshow, uh, an attention grabbing ploy. But ultimately, of course, it became a serious endeavor. When did you realize that this was something that was a, a real prospect? And what was your involvement early on? Were you just kind of watching on the sidelines and continuing to work in the business exclusively or early on were you conscripted to participate in the campaign or in the preparation for this prospect? I was intrigued from early on. I mean, first of all, there was a talk, first talk of him running for governor of New York, which I thought also made a lot of sense. You know, now that I've spent three years in government, I realized sometimes politicians are not the best people to be running things. That doesn't mean there aren't great politicians. There are. But I do think sometimes a strong business person brings something to the table that politicians sometimes don't. Uh, so I was intrigued by that, but very quickly that governorship became a uh, change to him running for president. I was super intrigued by that. He was obviously up against, I don't remember if it was 15, 16 or 17 other seasoned candidates who ran at the same time. So while I was, um, I was confident that he had a shot and that he can make a great president, I also realized you know, maybe the world wasn't ready for that. Maybe, you know, Washington doesn't work that way. I didn't work on the campaign in any formal capacity. I definitely was out there in terms of writing opinion pieces of what I thought of Donald Trump, both with respect to Israel, with respect to Jews and things that came up along the way. I did that voluntarily. I touch on this in my book. I had a quite a busy job, you know, normally, and my job only became even more amped up in terms of its busyness because of him running for president. And then eventually when he one, having to uh, transition the company so that he could occupy the Oval Office. I think that the experience was just a remarkable experience, watching him slowly narrow the playing field and eventually get the nomination, the Republican nomination, and then eventually actually win. Going into election night, I think there's, there's a lot of different versions. Some people say that he himself had no belief that he would win, and others say, no, he was, you know, and people report different things they overheard. I mean, there's, you know, the endless uh, rumors and speculation. What was your mentality though that night? Did you actually believe that there was a legitimate shot or you were just kind of watching to wait, see what would happen? No, I, I definitely thought he had a, a legitimate shot. I didn't catch any whiff of him being skeptical about his own win. I know I've read stories like that and I'm not saying I was with him the whole time, but I didn't catch any of that. I did hear from, you know, a campaign person who thought that for sure he wasn't going to win. It shows, you know, and people have strong opinions. Uh, it shows that this guy's opinion was obviously misguided. I thought that Hillary, while she had all this money and experience in terms of Washington politics, not necessarily experience governing, had a lot of unfavorables. And people were excited about the possibility of change from Donald Trump. And I think now that we can look back, and obviously there are certain things to look back that are negative, that some of his supporters did, not in my view because of him, but I think the policies that he was able to establish for the United States, uh, for its allies, its key allies, including Israel, really show what can happen when you have somebody who is not from the political machine, somebody who's not afraid of what the media says about him or her, somebody who uh, is willing to buck the system and stand by what they view as the truth and reality and the right policies to try to move forward. Was it apparent immediately that you would be taking a role in the administration. I mean, there was still a business to run. I know there was quite a bit of discussion about him needing to outsource his businesses or put them to bed for a while or whatever the correct term would be for that because of conflicts of interest and, and so forth. First of all, I would imagine as, a, as his chief legal officer, that would, would probably occupy a pretty important place in, in your consciousness at that time. 
how involved were you in that whole process? And was it clear to you that you were going to be going into the political sphere? Oh, no, not clear at all. Um, I write about this story in the book as well, because I think it's sort of an important, uh, how did he get there, right? So, you know, over the years, Donald Trump and I had some discussions about Israel. And then one day during the campaign, I was called down to a conference room where he was doing a press event. Uh, I don't remember if it was just Jewish journalists. It might have also had some evangelicals in the room, but it was a press event having to do with the Jewish community and or Israel. And one of the questions that was asked had to do with Israel. And well, there were several questions about Israel that he was in the midst of answering. But at some point during the conversation, one of the questions that was asked, he turned over to me to answer. It happened to be one of the most uh, important questions during the course of our time in the White House. It had to do with what I call Judea and Samaria, what others call the West Bank, what should never be called occupied Palestinian territory, because that's just not true. Um, had to do with settlements. I don't like using the term settlements. I know it's history, but I think really people should call them what they are, which are towns, neighborhoods, and cities. Settlements has become a pejorative term. So I answered the question. And then um, shortly after that, I don't remember the exact sequence, but the president or candidate at the time named me and our former ambassador to Israel, a good friend of mine, David Friedman, his Israel advisors. So we played an informal role in advising the campaign about Israel policy. Uh, Jared Kushner also played a very important role that he was doing much more uh, than us. Our focus was really about Israel. And then uh, after he won at some point, uh, Jared and I had some conversations about me possibly joining. Of course, I was, you know, up to my eyeballs in transitioning the work. So um, I wasn't sure where it would go. And then one day he actually asked me and, uh, you know, my mouth flew open when he asked me. It was really, you know, the idea of joining the White House, but in particular being able to join to help work on the U.S.-Israel relationship, the you know resetting that because we felt that it suffered under the prior administration, working on the possibility of peace between Israel and the Palestinians and Israel and its Arab neighbors, it's one of those things you know how do you possibly say no to? And I was just you know so honored and touched that he asked me. I blurted out yes without realizing I need to tell my wife and my kids or ask my wife and my kids I suppose. So I, I didn't take it back, but I did say, you know, uh, can we talk about this on Monday? It was a Friday. I said, I just want to make sure my wife and kids are okay with it. And of course, by then he was on to his next thing. He heard me, but I think in his mind, he knew it was happening. And um, let's just say it was quite an incredible conversation, our, our Shabbat dinner that, that Friday night. Now, to be clear, you did not have any experience in diplomacy or in Israel relations. You didn't come up through the ranks of, uh, of APAC or of any, you know, major Israel, pro-Israel organization, you were, quote unquote, just the guy. You were an attorney who was passionate about Israel because you were Jewish and grew up in an observant Jewish community where Israel plays a central role. Am I correct in that assumption? Absolutely correct. Uh, there was a lot of press written about myself, David Friedman, and Jared. Uh, you know, who are these three guys who think that they can make peace? You know, what do they know about diplomacy and this and that? And Look, in the end, uh, thank God, we accomplished some quite amazing things because of President Trump and the other courageous leaders in the region. Uh, so in retrospect, I could tell you that you don't need diplomacy to be a diplomat. You don't need experience in organizations to do what we did. That doesn't mean that those people couldn't function equally well. There's a lot to be said for everything that they do, but tearing people down just because they come from the outside is not the right approach. I think me being a lawyer had was very, very important. Being a lawyer taught me how to listen really well, to understand the issues really well, to try to forge consensus really well. And I think that doesn't mean only lawyers could do this job either, but I think that that 20 years of experience was very, very important. I think being honest and, and truthful about things as opposed to doing a diplomatic dance that you know doesn't sometimes get to the issues and, and being close to President Trump as both David and I and of course Jared were, was also really, really critical to this role. Now, this is going back to 2016. Can you briefly summarize the state of the peace process or perhaps the non-state of the peace process at the time between the Arabs and the Palestinians? And in addition, I think, I guess the predominant thinking at the time in foreign policy circles was that Palestinian-Israeli conflict was the linchpin to broader regional relations and that addressing the former was vital 
to even begin to think about addressing the latter. And that's something that obviously you belied through your approach. But what was going on at the time when you were first entering into this arena? Yeah, both really important questions. I, I get into those actually very deeply in the book because they're so fundamental to what we came into. The peace process was dormant, non-existent when we came into it. You know, one of the, it was funny to watch the press about how, you know, who are these guys who are going to come in and and make peace as if there was an ongoing peace process and we're going to break all the eggs, right? President Obama tried, didn't succeed. I don't blame him. Now, I understand the issues really well now, and uh, I can understand why he failed, but there was no peace process to speak of between Israel and the Palestinians. And and I think just to jump ahead, I think that I hope that President Biden doesn't try to start a peace process now. I don't have any indication that he will. But if I was sitting in front of him now, I would say just now's not the time. The Palestinian leadership is just not ready to do anything meaningful or realistic in terms of negotiating peace. In terms of the knowledge base, you know, the idea that nothing will happen in the region until the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is resolved, it's absolutely true that that's what everybody was saying from the moment we walked into office. Uh, John Kerry, you know, said it even not too long before the Abraham Accords was actually signed. For whatever reason, people used phrases like, this is the core conflict of the region. Nothing is going to happen without it. And I don't want to say that we didn't hear that hundreds and hundreds of times throughout the world in all of the meetings that I attended. But we also pointed out that it wasn't true. You know, you have this terrible civil war in Syria. You have these terrorists, the Houthi terrorists in Yemen attacking Saudi Arabia and now the United Arab Emirates. You have the Iran issue, which is probably the worst of all of them. You have Lebanon in disarray. You have Hamas in Gaza subjugating 2 million Palestinians and attacking Israel. There are so many conflicts going on in the Middle East. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is but one of them. And over time, it became clear to us, you know, a lot of my time was spent talking to Arab leadership about how they'll all be better off together with Israel, working together against these fights. It really, to me, was much more of a fight of good versus evil than it was Israeli-Palestinian. And I think the results show that the approach that we took was the correct approach. So what were your first steps that you immediately go into this process thinking more broadly about the, the bigger strategic vision? Or did you go in initially saying, okay, I'm going to tread that traditional path of, you know, meeting with Abbas and whoever else and trying to start the engine back up on the, on the peace process? Or did you right away have kind of a more disruptive approach to things? So my view is that we weren't ready to be disruptive until we understood everything in front of us. And we spent a lot of time, or at least I spent a lot of time, understanding the playing field, understanding the conflict. So at the beginning, I had just tons and tons of conversations with Israelis, Palestinians, leadership, Arabs, uh, meaning Arab leadership as well, former diplomats, including so many who had worked on the file before, think tanks. It was a tremendous listening tour. My first trip to Israel, I think it was in March of 17, was dubbed a listening tour, and the press absolutely had it correct. I wanted to hear what the Prime Minister of Israel was saying, what President Abbas was saying, what ordinary Israelis and Palestinians were saying, and there was nobody that was ready for a jump start on the peace process. But as we started to interact with the Arab neighbors more and more, we realized that there may be something there. It doesn't mean that they were ready to change. You know, there was a lot of press talking about this outside-in approach where the Arab neighbors would sort of coalesce with Israel. And uh, at the time, the description was kind of force President Abbas to sign a deal. I didn't buy into that. I definitely saw the seeds of hope of Arab nations in some capacity developing relationships with Israel. I didn't see any sign of Arab nations trying to press the Palestinians to sign something that the Palestinians weren't ready to sign. I think that it would have been a bad approach, right? First of all, you don't even have a Palestinian leadership one Palestinian leadership. You have a leadership in Ramallah, the Palestinian Authority, President Abbas, and then you have Hamas. There are two million Palestinians in Gaza that are ruled by Hamas. President Abbas is not the guy in charge there. In fact, there's a bitter, bitter rivalry between President Abbas's camp and Hamas, and people forget about that. So the Israeli-Palestinian peace process was, you know, not only dormant, there was a lot of work to begin to see how and if that could be accomplished. But the Arab countries were very supportive of the Palestinians, willing to 
entertain out of the box ideas while also supporting them. And um, I think we, you know, we weren't the first to think about it. There were many others who came before us who tried, thought about it, didn't have success because the timing and the, you know, the, the landscape just wasn't the right landscape. Um, and I think the success that President Trump had is built on each of those endeavors over time. Sometimes it's just waiting for that last puzzle piece to be clicked into place. And, you know, we did three years of it. Uh, more actually, because the Abraham Accords was signed after I left. But credit to those who came before us, including Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, you know, was doing things, uh, they say, under the table, right behind closed doors, the Arab leadership, um, lots and lots of steps went into this. Uh, I'll maybe just end this answer with one point. I was speaking at an event in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and a former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. mentioned, you know, with all great credit to President Trump and everybody else, for the Abraham Accords, everybody in the room should know that there were diplomats traveling to some of these Arab countries for years trying to make this happen. And he's absolutely correct. The Abraham Accords has many, many parents, right? Thank God. The biggest, most important parents are President Trump and the Arab leaders who were courageous and bold enough to sign them. But there were many people along the way who kept building those bridges, which eventually led to the Abraham Accords. And that's why I called my book In the Path of Abraham, because it really is a long path, a complicated path, and there's a lot more path to be built and stepped across through. How were you originally welcomed by these Arab leaders, the broader Arab world? I mean, here you have three Orthodox Jews, it almost sounds like a sitcom or something, you know, going to Bahrain or Qatar or UAE, and having these meetings with erstwhile foes, how did they look upon you? What was your initial reception by these individuals? So I myself was slightly uncomfortable. I didn't know what to expect. But for the minute I stepped in the room, any room in the region, including, by the way, the Palestinians, I was warmly welcomed. My Jewish observance was respected. One of my first meetings with the Palestinians, you know, they had this big meal prepared for a lot of people, and they made sure that I had kosher food on the table. Their food looked great, by the way. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't just get everyone kosher shawarma. What's the, they, all, they eat the same thing anyway. <laughs> right, but they did go out of their way to make sure I didn't just have like a little sandwich and a pickle. You know, they made sure to buy some very um, tasty food, kosher food. My rabbi, you know, I, I had to ask him a lot of questions along the way. You can imagine where my tefillin have been. And, and today, by the way, it's, it's a little bit of a joke, right? But back then, you know, people did have serious questions of, our, can you bring your tefillin in? I remember there was one time where the State Department had asked me to fill out a visa form. I won't say which country, and it's not the country's fault. It was the State Department's fault. And I had to click religion, and the choices were Muslim, Christian, or other. Uh, you could hand fill it in, by the way. And I, I wrote Jew, and the person looked at me and said, you can't write that. You have to click either Christian or other. I said, well, I'm not Christian, so I'm not clicking Christian. And I don't consider myself an other. And they gave me a hard time, whoever this was. And, and, and I don't know that this was the policy of the State Department. This was just that person who was helping me fill out the paperwork felt that this was the best way to handle it. I understand where the person came from. I mean, that is traditionally probably how they handled it. And, you know, they didn't want to rock any boats. And I said, so-and-so, I'm the peace guy. If I can't write Jew on this form, what does that say about any kind of peace process? I don't remember how I ended up doing it. I'd like to think that I filled out Jew and all was okay. Um, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't remember. I should. Proudly Orthodox Jew. <laughs> right. But I have to say, you know, from anyone in any of these Arab countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, you name it, and the Palestinians, I really want to stress that. I only got respect for who I was and my observance. And it reminded me as, and, and I see this now all the time when I'm there, how much alike the societies are. You know, both societies have, you know, secular people, religious people, but they understand religion. So for all the media who used to make fun of us because we were observant Jews and what do we know about making peace with Arabs? In retrospect, I would say it's actually quite the opposite. We were able to build bridges in a way that made sense because we understood each other's customs and religious observe common vocabulary in a sense exactly it's interesting because i guess every state actor acts out of self-interest to some degree uh, if not primarily as they probably should 
that being said, I guess the cynics, and maybe they would call themselves the realists, would argue that these countries have been largely driven by their own fears of Iran and their own economic interests and so forth. And others would like to see it at least a little bit more optimistically or altruistically or idealistically in that, no, these countries recognize there's a value to peace in and of itself and bridge building among nations. Which sort of narrative do you subscribe to having been in those rooms? I don't want to give you a cop-out answer, but both. They really are both very important. So let's take the um, self-serving. And President Trump got a lot of heat for his Make America First uh, slogan. But in the end, he's the president of the United States of America. It's his job to protect Americans, to use American taxpayer money wisely, you know, all the many things that a president has to do. And just because the policies that he wanted to put forth um, maybe annoyed or angered our European allies, he's not the president of the European Union, he's the president of the United States. So each of these leaders in the region, if they were worried about Iran or anything else, they had the right to be worried about Iran and the other problems in the region. And there was definitely a component of what is best for these countries to not only protect their citizens, but also to bring their citizens forward with all their various visions that they have now. And I think these are, you know, um, really, really important visions that they're each proposing. That said, I would say that the second absolutely is true. The warmth, the respect, the desire to live in a peaceful region, to have their kids not grow up the same way, not have hate uh, drive things the way it did decades ago was, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I would say equally, more or less, I, I don't have a way to gauge it, but if I had to guess, it's um, even more so. Uh, the people that I got to know there from the leadership to you know, diplomats and ordinary people like you and I, who I became friendly with, they want to raise their families with warm, peaceful relations, not only with Israel, but you know, with everybody in the region. And they also recognize that inevitably there are bad people out there, there are evil people out there, they're going to undo that. And they have to protect themselves and their countries from those people. Take me through the sort of the mechanics, maybe a, a high level summary of what happened once you started having these meetings, you went on your, your listening tour, you forged relationships with not only Palestinian leadership, but the broader regional players as well. How did it get from there to signing accords and normalizing relationships that had been non-existent, if not downright hostile for decades? So let me just start with the Palestinians. Although I developed a close relationship with the leadership in Ramallah and Palestinians in the West Bank, and even some Palestinians who came in from Gaza, not the leadership, but you know, ordinary people there, that all completely got cut off when President Trump made his um, historic announcement to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. And he was the only president who actually followed through. Others were signing waivers, even though they made promises as well. And the Palestinian leadership then used that as the excuse to cut ties with us in the end permanently. Um, you know, what I thought maybe at maximum it would be six months to a year before they came back, but they never came back. So that relationship fizzled, um, I think much to their detriment. If anything, clearly they lost their influence over the Arab countries because they just disappeared from the scene. Uh, they were trashing the peace to prosperity plan that President Trump rolled out uh, that I was privileged to work on. He released it maybe six to eight months before the Abraham Accords were signed. They were not only trashing it, they were basically making these crazy statements that they hope the peace plan will be born dead. And how do you, if you want to lead your people, you may disagree with the peace plan. You may disagree with every page of the peace plan, but either you want to lead, you know, or cause your citizens to lead better lives and help them live better lives and safer lives and, and all that that entails, or you don't to trash it before you even understood one word of the peace plan just shows where they were coming from at the time. So what's the road? The road was constant conversations, showing everybody that America stood by Israel, showing everybody that America stood by its Arab allies as well. I think one fault of the Biden administration now is it ruptured a relationship with Saudi Arabia, one of the key players, if not the key player in the region. I think that relationship now has to be repaired by the Biden administration, but showing our friends and allies that we do stand by them, getting rid of the diplomatic talk, the sort of empty words that mean nothing, pushing everybody, you know, what do you mean by this? Why do you say this? Why do you say this? And really none of it could have happened if we didn't have 
this new leadership in the region, and they're not so new, but leaders in the region, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, all of them, really being willing to take chances, understanding that the old talking points didn't work, never will work, and being willing to walk down a road with the support of the United States. And then you just have to wait for the right moment. And uh, that right moment actually came after I had already left the White House, but the infrastructure was there. Um, you know, there were lots of stumbling blocks, including multiple Israeli elections. We're, we're seeing that once again. Fifth time's a charm, Jason. Right. You know, we think Washington is tough. Uh, uh, Jerusalem could be tough too, right? But it's many, many, many steps to construct that bridge. And then you, you know, you just finally put that last piece of wood in and secure it and boom, it's there. When did you know that something historic was happening, that there was a breakthrough that was indeed unprecedented? Well, there were many hints along the way. I mean, I remember when I reached out to the UAE about having Israel have an exhibition at the World Expo. You know, they had already been talking. It wasn't a new thing to them. And the answer from the UAE was great. Sure. No, no problem. We're just working on security arrangements, right? This is before anyone really had any clue that there'd be an Abraham Accords, right? But there were so many examples like that along the way, there was no question in my mind that things had changed dramatically. It really was just a question of when, not if. So things that seemed so dramatic at the time, uh, Israelis participating in sporting events, the Israeli national anthem being played at sporting events, so many things. Uh, now they all seem so mundane, but they were big. But and I say this even today for those countries who have not yet signed the Abraham Accords, that's what I like to call them. We needed then, and we still, for those who didn't sign yet, we need to now give them the time and the space and the respect to do it in their own time. Each country will take its baby steps in a way that makes sense for their country to make sure that they're not rocking the boat in a way that could undo other efforts that they're busy doing. And you know, these countries are doing a lot of things and Israel is only one component of them. We have to respect that. We have to respect that they all are leaning in that direction. And whether it takes another month or 10 years, our goal should be just trying to continue to build the bridges to make that area safer, more secure, and a better place for everybody. And not sort of demand that, you know, oh, you have to sign the Abraham Accords for things to progress. Every interaction between whether it's Israel and its Arab neighbors, Jews and its Arab neighbors, American and Arab countries is an important step in helping to build that path of peace. Now we could spend obviously hours, if not much more going through every detail, but that's what the book is for, which we'll get into it in, in a minute. Uh, I just want to kind of ask you to wrap this part of the conversation up. If you could identify maybe one proudest moment, maybe a snapshot in time when you stopped and paused and reflected Maybe you looked around and there was something taking place around you, a ceremony or, or an experience where you realized, you know, we've really done something special here. We've really done something to advance peace, to save lives, to build a better world. Was there any such moment that really stands out for you? Well, thank God I actually have many, but perhaps the one that sticks out based on the nature of your question was when President Trump unveiled the Peace to Prosperity Plan. Why? Because although the plan itself failed because the Palestinians didn't have the courage to engage on it, who was in the room? The UAE ambassador, the Oman ambassador, and the Bahrain ambassador. That was huge. Uh, huge at the time, it remains huge. So even if those countries didn't agree with everything in the plan, they were courageous enough to say, we're here because we support the Palestinian people. And we think that this could be the basis of a discussion and negotiation to see if we could bring peace to the region. I think that the leadership there in those countries needs to be commended for that. I think others in the region as well, because I think the consensus generally was that this was a good faith plan, even though, you know, each of those countries had serious issues with it. I think even if you look at the statements, I know that some of the major uh, media criticized the plans, but if you look at how many statements came out from countries around the world, including a country like Saudi Arabia, the statements were positive, important, and that whole environment, I think, changed the dynamic of the conversation, even though the Palestinians sort of uh, pulled the curtain around themselves and walked away or never even showed up to, to the theater, if you will. So I think that's just one example of 
showing how things had dramatically changed in the region. Now, there is a new book out, The Path of Abraham. And uh, tell us a little bit about the book, how it came about, what you're, you're focusing on, what you hope to accomplish with the book. And then as well, you mentioned to me uh, off air before we recorded that you have a podcast as well, which of course is a, a medium I love. Normally, by the way, the listeners can't see our setup, but we have the visual here. And uh, so I always get to see the guests set up and their microphone. Normally, I dominate the microphone battle. But in this case, my companion here also has a wonderful microphone, which is a function of his podcast. So tell us about the book and then a little bit about the podcast as well. Sure. So In the Path of Abraham was, um, I decided to write it after I had turned down some offers writing the typical Washington, D.C. kind of salacious, gossipy, you know, what do you know about the White House, Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not my style. I think it's inappropriate. You shouldn't be working somewhere with, a, with an aim to just gossip about people. But there were others, friends and people that I respect who said, all that is good, Jason, but you had front row seats to something incredibly historic. You have to write about that experience. So I put pen to paper and realized as I was writing and as this was unfolding that I was incredibly fortunate to work for an administration and have relationships with Israel and its Arab neighbors that allowed these amazing things to happen. The book is very much about who we were, what we learned, which is really key. I mean, if there's one theme I want to stress, it's what we learned doing what we did and uh, how it all unfolded. There's a lot of myth busting, you know, a lot of people use all sorts of terminology and uh, make all sorts of statements, mostly anti-Israel. A lot of those people, most of those people that I came across actually either don't know what they're talking about or are incredibly misleading. So I spend a lot of time myth busting and uh, it really helps the reader understand, and it may be the only book of its kind at the moment that talks about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Israeli-Arab conflict, the Israel-U.S. relationship, and how those three intertwined under a very unique set of leaders, President Trump being the driving force, but Bibi Netanyahu and each of the Arab leaders in the region, those that did sign the Abraham Accords and those that didn't, how all of that came together to change the dynamic of the region and improve the lives of millions and millions of people. There's a lot more to do. You know, that's why it's called in the path of Abraham, because this path has a long way to go. A lot more still has to be built, but that's the goal of the book. As far as the Diplomat podcast, uh, which is hosted by Newsweek, I was very grateful for Newsweek to give me the opportunity. It's meant to have discussions on things that are important in today's world. My recent podcast focused around Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been in the news a lot. It's very, very misunderstood. I'm glad President Biden is going there. As I said earlier, I hope he repairs the relationship there. But I'm doing a bunch of podcasting about that. I've interviewed some very prominent figures, uh, Mike Pompeo, Nikki Haley, Tony Blair, political leaders throughout the Arab world. We've talked about issues such as anti-Semitism, Whoopi Goldberg's comments. It really ranges from what's in the headlines today, getting some great guests and just trying to have people uh, not from a political perspective, but just have open, honest, kind of raw conversation about the issues of the day. So now, since 2020, I imagine you're back in the private sector. What have you been up to career-wise in your life? Mostly I'm connecting Israeli and American companies with countries and companies in the Arab world. I started a company called Abraham Venture before the Abraham Accords. I started it. <laughs> just after I uh, left the White House, because I believed so much in where we were going and the name Abraham obviously um, resonated with me. And while it's a commercial endeavor, I also spend a lot of time continuing to build those bridges. I do spend a fair amount of time in the region. I do have very heartfelt discussions with the region, with leadership in the region and others about Israel, Israel's place in the region, uh, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And also uh, my primary bread and butter is connecting people, but I also spend a lot of time continuing to build that path. So I imagine you're traveling a lot and soliciting investment for Israeli companies. Is that it's kind of a venture capital endeavor? Less soliciting investment. I am the co-chair of a blockchain fund with uh, Silver Road Capital. Uh, we're working on a blockchain fund. The companies that, you know, the fund will hopefully invest in, a lot of them are in Israel, but we'll also look at, you know, the U.S., Europe, and the Middle East, by the way. You know, I think that 
Israeli capital should be flowing into the Middle East. I think a one-way street where capital from the Arab countries into Israel is not going to make this Abraham Accords last and grow. I think it needs to be a two-way street. So I do spend time on that venture capital blockchain fund, but it's also allowing Israeli and American products, products ranging from security to services to other kinds of products, introducing them to a region that they don't understand. It's a region that I've come to understand very, very well. It's a region that I love. I love spending time in. And this is from a guy who loved Israel. And now, you know, I feel as at home in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or the UAE or Bahrain, as I do in Israel, which is pretty remarkable considering my background. But it's meant to allow those societies to kind of build things together and make money together and improve lives together. And Jason, where can people get the book or learn more about you and your journey generally? So the book is available wherever books are sold, probably the easiest way. And, you know, we get tons of their boxes every day is Amazon. If you go on Amazon and search uh, In the Path of Abraham, you'll find it there. It's already available on Audible. It'll come out in print. It'll be shipped, I think, on July 19th. You could also go to jasongreenblatt.com. And you can go to inthepathofabraham.com if you want to order it through there and learn more about the book. Jason Greenblatt, a diplomat who did not sign up to be a diplomat, but uh, an attorney turned world change maker and now a author as well as a podcaster. Thank you so much for everything you've done for not just the Jewish people, but the world at large. I, of course, is just as a Jew, as a, a lay person watching these events unfold, so inspired and moved by what seemed unimaginable only a few short years ago. And uh, it, it's really been remarkable to watch it. I'm so honored to speak with someone who had such a profound hand in that whole process. Jason Greenblatt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me as a guest. Thank you for your kind words and uh, tremendous continued success on your podcast. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.